I'd love for a few hands to go up and we'll take a few to start. Well, one of the things we shared is how the course of COVID and how quickly you can run up a, a, significant, bill, a significant bill uh, depending upon what uh, is happening in your family situation. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we just heard how significant co-pays can be and how they can run the bill up very quickly. Thank you. So I was just sharing this story, uh, sorry, right? Suzanne. Suzanne, and I was telling her that I came to this country as a child immigrant, and growing up here, um, our case in the Justice Department was going to funk, so we were without papers for 12 years, and during that time, it was very hard on my family. I was young, so I didn't have to go to um, hospital or see doctor, but my mom was diabetic and I was a heart patient, and I saw the suffering that she couldn't afford a proper health care, and she would lie to us that she went to a doctor and she would skip medications and skip doctor trips. And, and neighbors didn't even know she was suffering. Nobody knew until like I really grew up and I saw like what it did to my mom. Her uh, health worsened. I wish she had something, some kind of coverage back then. Um, so this connection between me and your health legislation is very personal. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. So I have a couple of stories I will share with the nice back of my head. <laughs> um, when my, my mother passed away in February from breast cancer, she didn't have sufficient health insurance, so she really just couldn't get the proper care that she needed. So it just came to a point when she just decided, you know what? I accepted my fate, and I was going to be just let me be comfortable, let me enjoy these last moments with my people and I'll be fine. So that was really very difficult for all of us to really, um, and there's nothing that we can do. And then also now, I am currently a man, good? And because my mom passed before the, the process of, the individual process was completed, I'm just kind of like stuck now, wondering like what to do, so I don't have access to this either. So. I'm in a position where I have to really try so hard not to get sick. Do you understand what I mean? Like, I'm doing all the reading of the different horrible stuff or the preventative just so I don't get sick because I can't afford to be sick. And then also as a nanny where you're caring for children, you oftentimes get employers who will tell you, well, if you fall in sick today, don't bother coming back. Your job is not going to be here for you anymore. And sometimes I wonder, if you really truly care for your children, would you want me to come work sick to make them sick? Like, does that make any sense to you? And um, there's currently a story, because I do some volunteer work with NWA, of a nanny who is working in a wheelchair. She broke her leg, and the family said, well, no big deal, come to work with a wheelchair. So she's in the park with a very active child. How is she supposed to provide proper care? And why would you want your child in the care of someone who's not mobile? So these are some things that we've seen and have experienced when it comes to healthcare. I think let's end there. Um, that was a very powerful series of stories. Um, and I mean, I know for me, I felt it very deeply when you were sharing about your mother, so thank you very much. Um, and just to say, I'm sure it's apparent to everyone, and probably it came through in everyone's stories in some way, that this issue is affecting people in every place of our society. This is an issue that cuts across race, region, and class so in so many different ways. It's an issue that impacts, like we said, the vast majority of us. And that is that is a very difficult thing to really comprehend, to really take in, but it is also our power. We can build a unstoppable movement of people based on the fact that in this room, I am sure we would be able to fill the rest of our time here with your story. Um, so I really look forward to us continuing to hear from one another throughout the evening and also really getting to learn more about these issues and being able to take all of our learning here tonight 
and be able to turn that into action together. So thank you all so much. Um, I'm going to turn us over to our next section and thank you for sharing your stories. So we're diving into our panel tonight. I'm going to uh, introduce you to Wynn Perisami, who is the policy analyst with FPWA, a broad network of nonprofits, 170, I believe, throughout the state. Uh, and she is going to introduce our esteemed panelists tonight. Let's hear it for Wynn. And the stories and to really think about health equity tonight. It's really powerful. Um, so as our panelists are so far coming up, um, your seats are over on the side here, guys. Um, I'm going to start by introducing you to Ollie Klein. Um, Dr. Oliver Klein is uh, the chair of Physicians for National Health Programs, um, he, the New York Metro chapter. Um, he is also a practicing internist and professor Professor of Clinical Medicine and Public Health at Will Cornell Medical College, um, as well as the Associate Dean, and has many more uh, uh, qualifications. Um, it's a pleasure, and he is going to uh, kick us off by giving us an overview of this thing called the New York Health Act, what it means, and why we should care so much about it. So it's really, uh, really a, a great honor to be here, uh, and in particular, one of the things that I uh, attracted me to be here tonight is that I live in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that seemed to me to be a special opportunity. So. Um, first slide really uh, has to do with a disclaimer, uh, that is to say, uh, I do not believe I have any relevant financial relationships with commercial interests that shape this talk. Uh, but you have heard that I am the local chapter chair for Physicians for a National Health Program, uh, but I have taken absolutely no compensation from that organization. If anything, uh, I have given money to it. So, um, starting off, let me say first that uh, yes, we all are aware of uh, you know the uh, Affordable Care Act, also named Obamacare. Uh, and 92% of Americans agree that we all have a right to affordable care. Uh, and that's something that's really very exciting to, in fact, be aware of. But Obamacare has not solved the central problems in our healthcare system. There are still close to 28 million people who have no health insurance. There are millions more, frankly, who are underinsured. Uh, they have to pay cash out of pocket before their insurance kicks in, or they have to pay a, a co-payment or things of that sort. And costs continue to rise, and physicians actually object to the micromanaging of medical practices in an attempt to control costs. Uh, we have to do all those clicks on computers so that we can maximize the revenue uh, that our institution collects or that we personally collect. So that what you see here on a slide like this uh, is that, you know, a family premium, on average, in an employer 
sponsored health insurance is now costing $19,600. Did you realize that? And the average worker is contributing $5,547 to pay for that premium. Uh, whereas the employer, uh, again, because unions have negotiated it, usually uh, have, is paying somewhere to around $14,000. So this is an enormous cost, right? Uh, and private health insurance coverage continues to decline. And what you see here back in 2008, you know, we had, uh, you know, over 55% of people that were employed had health insurance, and now we're down to lower or below 50% of people who are employed have health insurance. Um, and, frankly, there's also a shrinkage of retirement coverage. Many employers gave you a retirement package to help compensate for some of the inadequacies of our uh, Medicare program. But, as you can see, that's gradually declining as well. And Medicaid enrollment is, in fact, going up substantially. Uh, you know, essentially, uh, particularly for the elderly, frequently Medicaid takes up the slack where, in fact, Medicare uh, has left off. But we still have, you know, 28 million people without health insurance in the United States. Um, and when you look at insurance costs, What's, gone, what's happened is since 1999 up to 2018, uh, premiums have gone up 239%. Whoa, right, you're shaking your head, you're absolutely right. But the employee's contribution has gone up more than that, 259%. At the same time that the employees' wages have only gone up 68%, and inflation has eaten away roughly 51% of those uh, increases. Little wonder, frankly, that you know uh, the, the, the major cause of bankruptcy here in the United States is, in fact, due to medical expenses. And what you see here is that the out-of-pocket costs are increasing uh, such that the deductible for the average health insurance policy that I was describing to you before is on average roughly $1,500. In other words, before the insurance kicks in, you have to pay out $150. Uh, $1,500, uh, and when you look at that, what you find is that roughly 26% of people in this country really find that that's too much. Uh, and if they have fair or poor health, that number goes up close to 50%, 46%. Uh, really find that they can't afford that out-of-pocket cost. And more than one million New Yorkers, and actually here in Brooklyn, 300,000 Brooklynites remain uninsured. Uh, and it just doesn't have to be that way. If you look here uh, in terms of the costs of health care, uh, yes, Back here in terms of the European countries, uh, the Western industrialized countries, we were in the pack, uh, yes, the most expensive in the pack, but what's happened is that they all have in fact increased the technology in medicine, 
CAT scans and MRIs and what have you, but their costs haven't gone up the way ours has, so that we are now costing twice as much as most other industrialized nations. So how do we deal with this problem? And the New York Health Act is one major step dealing with the problem of cost in healthcare. Uh, Richard Godfrey uh, in the assembly has introduced this. Uh, Gustavo Rivera has been the minority chair of the health committee in the Senate uh, and has uh, endorsed this direction. And what is the New York Health Act? Well, it's a single state fund, a trust fund in which, uh, you know, frankly, all the Medicare, Medicaid, you know, uh, ACA dollars are placed. In addition, every employer's contribution to health insurance through the, uh, you know, uh, premiums that they pay go into that pool. And that state fund covers every resident in New York State. Every resident. Well, that means that in fact we're covering even the undocumented. Why? Because it's both humane to do that and also a good public health thing, you know. If you ride the subways the way I do, you want the person next to you to in fact have health insurance, right? so that in fact they aren't people communicating diseases to you. The benefits should be comprehensive and we'll describe what we mean by that. No financial barriers to receiving care. That means you don't have those out-of-pocket deductibles. You don't have to co-pay um, for Part B and Part D of Medicare. Uh, as you probably know, those of you who are in the Medicare age retirement range, you have to pay a premium, Part B. You have to pay a premium for Part D. Well, New York Health is gonna pay those premiums. And this is funded essentially through public funds and a progressive tax form, and we'll describe that to you in a few minutes. And the amazing thing is that although we will cover everybody, uh, I believe we can do that for less than what we are doing today. So let's see how we get to all of that. We start with what are the benefits? They're comprehensive, primary, preventive, you heard about those. Mental health, very important, and substance abuse care. Inpatient and outpatient hospital care prescription drugs and medical devices, specifically dental, vision, and hearing is mentioned uh, as something that's going to be covered. Why? Anyone know why? Because Medicare doesn't cover those things. So this is better than what people presently get on Medicare. Long-term care, you've heard some of the needs for that. That means not just nursing homes, but in fact care in people's homes. Very, very crucial. Free choice of doctor and hospital, and kind of a unique feature, a care coordinator to assist in navigating the system. I call this a care finder, not a gatekeeper, not somebody to block you from getting for somebody to help you find care. The financing would be progressive. As I mentioned earlier, Medicare, Medicaid, child health insurance program, ACA funds all go into this trust fund. Uh, and then there is a progressive graduated payroll tax, 80% contributed by the employer, 20% by the employee a graduated tax on non-payroll uh, income, you know, the people that don't uh, pay taxes frequently, uh, those who get their income from dividends and investments, 
even landlords, right? Do they <laughs> get rent, but you know, do they pay taxes on it? Here they will, okay? New York Health pays, as I mentioned, the Part B and D premiums of Medicare. New York Health pays county and New York State share of Medicaid. Uh, and finally, all of this is going to cost less than the present New York spending. Ooh, my God, how does that happen? Uh, just to show you here for the Medicare recipients, you know, we had this uh, real attack on single payer national health insurance by the president, who said it's going to destroy the Medicare program. Oh, what is he? What is he thinking? Uh, this is it's just crazy. This is so much better than Medicare as it exists now. They, Medicare has deductibles and co-pays. New York Health doesn't. You know, physician care, premium, deductible, co-pays, all in the Medicare program. Prescription drugs, the same problem, not in New York Health Care. Dental, vision, hearing, covered, long-term care, uh, not quite yet in New York Health, but we have the promise from uh, Gottfried and Marek Rivera that they're going to introduce it, okay? Um, so this is, I think, an ex a substantial improvement in the Medicare program. Now, where does the money come from to pay for all, all of this? Uh, here you see the comparison between Medicare as it's presently structured in terms of costs that don't go to pay for care. In other words, uh, what we call billing or administrative or managerial costs, roughly 2%, and all economists seem to agree on this number, 2 to 3%. But WellPoint, Aetna, Humana, United Healthcare, anywhere it's from 14 up to 18%. What does that mean? It means that of the premium dollars collected, or the tax dollars collected, in Medicare, you get 98% that pay doctors, hospitals, you know, uh, you know, nurse practitioners. Whereas in private health insurance, what happens is that you, know, you don't get that kind of money. Only 85% goes to pay doctors, or sometimes uh, somewhere down as low as 80%. Um, there are these big savings from single payer, billing and insurance overhead. That this, you know, the whole problem of uh, you know those things that you have to do that the insurance company has to do to compete with the other insurance companies in terms of lowering premiums and costs. Uh, you can see that it's about 30 cents of every dollar compared to Canada, where it's just two cents, Canada being a single payer country. And here from uh, Dr. Friedman, who's up at uh, UMass, an economist, he shows you the more detailed ways of saving money. Uh, he argues here that there would be reduced insurance administrative costs, right? You wouldn't have to have all of those people denying claims, you know, delaying them, you know, so that we don't get paid for a while and have to challenge them. Reduced hospital administrative costs because hospitals, again, have to, in fact, fight with the insurance companies to get paid. And the bulk purchasing of drugs and devices, you know, which entity in this country gets the highest price, lowest price, uh, on prescription drugs? Anyone have a guess? Pardon? The VA. The VA, right, exactly. Why? Because it can bargain for price with the pharmaceutical industry. The problem with Medicare right now is that you have to go through a private, you know, prescription benefit management company. So Friedman felt that there would be a total savings of $55 billion in New York State. 
and he admits there'll be some increase. You know, if you eliminate co-pays and deductibles, that's going to cost you more, right? Um, he also proposes increasing the physician fees, which for Medicaid in particular are, can, are lower than what private health insurance pays. Let's increase those up to what private health insurance pays. And what you find is that, you know, it's going to be an increased cost there, uh, including, you know, uh, coverage for people who presently are not insured of roughly uh, $26 billion. But that leaves you with a savings, you know, uh, that he argues uh, is close to $29 billion. So there is here, whether you believe it or not, I think a real possibility for savings. And what you see uh, on this slide, looking nationally, um, you know, Medicare and Medicaid have kept the cost of health care down where private insurance has gone, uh, again, off the wall. Uh, the New York health tax essentially replaces private insurance, out-of-pocket costs, county Medicaid costs, and it gains billions in savings through administrative simplification uh, and bulk purchasing as well. Uh, here's a slide that uh, is probably hard to see down there, everywhere is in the room, but essentially what you see here is that people with incomes below $25,000 annually would not be asked to contribute that money to the New York Health Act. And then uh, you can see it goes up so that in fact people with incomes over $400,000 are going to be taxed uh, at close to 18% of income for the New York Health Act. Um, and the public supports this, okay? If you look at all voters out there and you ask them, you know, uh, do you favor a federal Medicare for all health insurance system that covers every American? And what you find is that 70% uh, of voters support it, roughly 20% oppose it, 10% aren't sure. Uh, and when you look over here with the Democrats, uh, they are, you know, over 80% in favor. Uh, and even the Republicans uh, are over 50% in favor. Um, so this is again an interesting phenomenon where there is public support for this. And as you know, this passed the assembly in this state back on June 1st, 87 to 38, two to one, and we had 31 senators endorse the New York Health Act, but we needed 32 votes. Technically, we should have that now. We will see how it works out, okay? And then the question, if the legislature passes the New York Health Act, uh, there'll be the big question, will Governor Cuomo so, what's next? Well, there's not going to be any vote on this this year, that's clear. Um, but next year, 2019, maybe we will see that. There will be statewide hearings, more attention from the media, visible support by unions and community groups, like hopefully you in this room. Uh, but what we will see is a real attack by those who oppose this, the insurance companies, the business interests, the right-wing think tanks, uh, they're all going to try to scare people. And it's really very important that those of us who are advocates for this uh, really understand uh, and can deal with the arguments that are brought against it. Uh, so there has to be strengthening more people, more money uh, for the campaign for New York Health. Um, so what do we get? Everyone is covered in the
the New York Health Act, no financial barriers to care, lower drug and equipment prices because we can negotiate with those pharmaceutical companies. When you've got 20 million New Yorkers negotiating, that's a powerful force. No unnecessary wasteful spending and planning and control of future costs. Well, let's go out and do it. Here's some contact. And if you really want to dig deeper, learn more about this, uh, go to the PNHP website. There's a lot of material there uh, that you can get. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Connie. Uh, so moving right along, we have a uh, Amanda Love. Uh, she is the Director of Advocacy at Action Services Committee, um, and she has been working in this space as an, as an advocate, particularly in the relation to HIV and AIDS for some 20, 25, or two, more. Two, two. Many, many years, many years, and she is a wonderful voice for immigrants who can speak more to what this act and what this bill means to the immigrant space. Amanda? that are not eligible for health insurance are undocumented immigrants. 
Brooklyn has always been proud of its immigrant heritage. And if I can quote from the Borough President's website, Brooklyn's diversity is a shining example of multiculturalism at work in the United States. In 2015, the Brooklyn Community Foundation estimated that close to half of Brooklyn residents are foreign born, or approximately one million individuals. The report also estimated that 164,000 immigrants in Brooklyn are undocumented, accounting for roughly 7% of the borough's total population. So from Dr. Fine, we've heard this evening about what the Health Care Act is, what it involves, but what can the Health Care, the New York Health Act mean for our immigrant communities, for literally hundreds of thousands of Brooklyn residents? The New York Health Act would provide universal insurance coverage with no co-pays, deductibles, or premiums, regardless of immigration status. Let me say that again. Regardless of immigration status. <laughs> what will the New York Health Act mean for our immigrant communities? The New York Health Act would increase the likelihood that hundreds of thousands more Brooklynites will actually go to the doctor when they are sick or in need of care. It would increase the likelihood that hundreds of thousands more Brooklynites will have regular visits with their doctor or other healthcare professionals who in turn will be able to identify risk factors and problems before they become serious. And as we know, preventative care reduces the need for expensive emergency room visits. And it would increase the likelihood that hundreds of thousands more Brooklynite stress levels will plummet in the knowledge that they are not going to be handed a huge medical bill big enough to bankrupt them and their families. It would increase the likelihood that hundreds of thousands more Brooklynites will be happy and healthy. What can hundreds of thousands of more happy and healthy Brooklynites mean for Brooklyn? A healthy, a happy, a more productive workforce, less absenteeism, both by workers as well as by our students. In effect, a stronger and a smarter Brooklyn. New York Health Act, what's not to lie? <laughs> Executive Director of the Brooklyn Wide Air Agency Council on Aging. She's been working in this space for some 22 years now, and uh, she is the perfect person to set us up on New York Health Act as it relates to elder services. Thank you so much. Very nice to see it's such a great turnout uh, at the uh, at an end of the day on a holiday week. So uh, thank you for for attending this very important. Uh, event. Um, you know, one thing, you know, we had two very good pre um, pre 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 presentations here, and um, one thing that I was just thinking about, um, at Statewide, we, we, uh, we run helplines where people will call us to get information on how to navigate the healthcare system and their insurance and prescription drug coverage. And um, so we see a lot of things that are happening day to day with people who have um, Medicare or or other programs. And um, one of the things that, that I always hear from people who are, who are not 65 yet, they'll say, oh, I can't wait to get to 65 because then I can access Medicare. And um, one of the things that we, we know, Med Medicare is a great program. And it's, you know, as you were seeing here, it's the 2% of the administrative cost is, 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 what, uh, is what it costs other than, than health insurance. However, the New York State Health Plan has, is better than Medicare. So you want Medicare for all, you want better than Medicare for all. The reason why we're saying that is because seniors spend an average of 37% of their Social Security checks on out-of-pocket costs. So as great as that Medicare is, they're still spending 37% of their income. And we know that 
people 65 and over in New York State, out of those, 30% only live on Social Security. They don't have pensions. They don't have, um, you know, they, they, they don't have annuities or IRAs, things like that. Um, we also know that Brooklyn has the largest amount of seniors and baby boomers in New York State. Um, while, while the census will tell you that 30% that, that, uh, of all seniors live in Brooklyn and that about 20, about 30% are, are in poverty, we know that our elderly economic index, which basically tracks the average cost of living for seniors in Brooklyn, 76% of Brooklyn households led by seniors are not making ends meet. So this is on a, this, so Medicare on its own is untenable for seniors, which is why um, New York State, being a very generous um, you know state as it is, when you compare it to others, has some other programs called you know QMB, you know quality Medicare, and, and those things go through the Medicaid system. So a senior can live. So somebody can live to be 65, right? and qualify to get Medicare, but the question is, can they afford to get Medicare? Because if they can't afford those co-payments and they can't afford going to the doctor and they can't afford their medications and they can't afford to sign up for those, for those programs, they're not gonna get the, 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 the healthcare that's needed. So um, New York Health, what they, what they would do would be absorb all of those costs, not just for seniors, but for everybody. And then that would make sure that we would have had, that we have Medicare for everybody, but a better Medicare for everybody. So um, one of the things I'm gonna, I'm gonna say is that it's very important to, to know that, um, that while you know, people will say, well, you have, just to, to, to dispel that myth, when you go out into the community, when, when you hear people say, well, seniors don't care about, you know, about New York health because they have Medicare, that's not true. Seniors, number one, want everybody to have as good health insurance as they could possibly have, but they also want to be able to participate in the same way that everybody else would, would be able to if they had a, a, a um, you know, a, 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 a New York Health Act uh, bill. So um, uh, the other, and the other thing that I have to talk about is long-term care. Um, long-term care, and, and I, have, I have an explanation of how, how New York State um, seniors would benefit you know, for, for, from this act back on, on the table. But long-term care in this paper doesn't talk about how, how it's covered under, under the Health Act because right now it's not covered. It, it will be, you know, it will start next year, it will be voted on next year. However, when we look at number one, in Brooklyn, 28% of seniors 65 and over have mobility issues and need care, need extra care. If that is not covered through, through their health insurance, then they're not gonna get care or they're gonna go broke trying to get it. So, um, so that is the other big reason why seniors, why, why it's very important for people 60 and over, 65 and over, to be able to participate in a, in, in a, a New York Health Act because, um, in this plan, because it will become then a, 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 a complete uh, service. It won't just be your premiums, your co-pays, and your prescription drugs, which cost an arm and a leg as it is right now, but it will also be the long-term care that will help them be able to stay living in the community with dignity. Thank you. Thank you again, Maria. Right on time. We are going to make our way into an open Q&A section. This is a point in time where you can ask your questions and I already see a, a hand, but um, just the flag. We're going to be using something known as progressive stack, um, which is essentially about um, bringing up uh, underrepresented voices. 